when I was listening to what you were saying, I thought that's really interesting. A writer and a scientist, there are some very, very similar processes that we're using to follow our dreams and the observational aspect is actually, I think, the thing that links us with our creative process. Um, I'm never usually nervous when I talk. <laughs> when I looked at the roster, I was going to say, can I swap? Because um, <laughs> science, the only subject I did that was um, worse than science was French, um, which I had one year of and can't remember one phrase of. So I was, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. But one of the things that you've, you've just opened the idea that I wanted to explore, in fact, because um, one of the things that it seems to me, I'm, I'm working on a climate change project as a humanities person. So I'm employed at the moment with the Wheeler Centre as a writer in residence. And part of my task is to talk to and teach and encourage 15 year olds to write about place and climate. Mm -hmm. And the project is deliberately to look at how the humanities can interact with science. So I've been doing this with school kids in Europe. It's mostly a European project. The thing that has struck me in, in you know, boning up and doing the reading is that it seems to me to have the interest and I, don't, I hope it's not too low to term, the courage to pursue science is that you must have incredible imagination, you must have incredible dreams that you want to pursue. So while we think about yeah, the scientist as the nerdy, logical <laughs> person of reason, it must be to have faith in what you're doing Dreams and imagination must drive you forward all the time, or I would think. Not all the time, but some of the time, absolutely. And I think the perception that scientists are not creative um, and that science itself is, is a fairly uh, logical way of, of thinking is um, probably due to the way that we're taught. Mm -hmm. And I, I've experienced a lot of um, conversations with younger people who I speak to about my... Um, experience in science and, and they basically have given up with their, their pursuit of science because they thought, oh, it's too hard, it's boring. Um, but often it actually takes a, a melding of the arts uh, with science to be able to explain mm -hmm. um, a very, very difficult concept. And I'll give you an example. My stepson is five and we were watching The Magic School Bus. Now this is a, a, a book I used to read as a kid and I thought it was really cool. Um, basically it's a bus that travels anywhere in the universe and Miss Frizzle is a mad primary school teacher and she can make the bus shrink so it can go inside your digest digestive system or can convert it into a rocket so you can go into outer space. And so in order to learn about the world and scientific principles, Miss Frizzle does amazing magic. And of course this is not real, but the concepts that she teaches are fantastic. And one of the, the episodes we were watching, because now it's a cartoon, which is fantastic, was about music and sounds. And this is where science um, can explain sounds. So physics, waveforms, and physics always used to completely miff me. I, I was I was unbelievably overwhelmed by my experience in high school and, and even in university. Um, but here my, my stepson, my, my five-year-old stepson was able to grasp what a sound wave looked like. And it's all because Miss Frizzle, lucky Miss Frizzle, brought some magic glasses and mm -hmm. the kids could see the sound waves and could see them bouncing off walls and could actually see which instruments were producing the longest and biggest sound wave, which sounds very loud. Um, and so we then later on had a bath and I put him into the bath and he said, oh, look, look, the, the waves on the water. That's exactly like a sound wave. And I said, well done, you've got it. Um, and so I think that science itself is very creative and especially if you can teach it in a creative way, then everyone has access to it. And so I, I guess I was lucky because my, in my dream to be a scientist, it was a very logical um, progression for me because I had a lot of creative people around um, teachers. My, my parents were teachers and so they brought a lot of um, description and, and um, visual pictures into what science was and how, how can we use science to understand the world. With that, I mean, touching on the, on the using um, a book, using um, animation, mm -hmm. what's the position, say, I have to say I'm in love with Brian Cox. That's um, pretty impressive. Yeah, and um, I'm a sucker for David Attenborough. Like, he, he would have been my favourite uncle. Um, <laughs> when you get those who are obviously they're great communicators mm. for that visual medium, how do, you, um, how do you see that role within the science community? Is, how do you talk about that when you go into work on Monday? I did see Coxie on the weekend. He's a bit <laughs> naff. Or I think I would lose it if I saw Brian Cox. Yeah. I'm just in a, or, as or awed by him as you. But um, I think that if, in order to inspire people into 
to being scientists and to making new discoveries and to coming up with that cure for reverse aging, perhaps for Betty. Um, we we need to be, for all of for us. all of us. <laughs> yeah, um, we we do need to inspire them to get into mm -hmm. to science, and so. Um, I guess the, the way to do that is actually to meld the arts with science because mm -hmm. art is actually one of the first things that, that we get involved in, finger painting and singing and looking mm -hmm. at books. And I guess now a lot of our kids are experiencing visual media and iPads and these sorts of things are fantastic teaching tools and why not use them to teach really complex topics like biology and the brain and physics? What I, about... I, think we're I mean, I said to you... Low. I said. Mm -hmm. You must dream all, all the time. You said not all the time. Mm. If we take that as well with having, as Deborah raised, having our dreams dashed, I was think this is what I, I was thinking, what, what, what I'm going to talk about. The thing that seemed to me to be really pertinent as someone outside the discipline, I could imagine, and this happens to me, I, I, I want to write a story. So when I talked to Andrew before, the original idea, when I see that frame and I think, there's a great story that I can feel it. So I, I get really excited and full of myself and I can do this and I'm really... And then sometimes you, you, you begin the work and it doesn't work. Now, sometimes you say, well, it's simply that I haven't written it well, etc. But sometimes an idea that you felt was something bigger is not anything bigger. Mm -hmm. I suppose the, the point would here, if, if, you, if you're excited, your imagination, your dreams, creatively about a scientific pursuit, I'll use the word experiment because I don't know anything better. What, what happens when that is dashed or your thinking has to shift or your thinking, in fact, is shown to be wrong? And I don't know, again, if that's the appropriate mm -hmm. word. Oh, that's How fine. does that sit with you when you've been excited about the possibility of uh, solving something mm -hmm. that you can't solve? If uh, scientific discovery resulted in um, constant eureka moments, then we would be... I think a lot smarter. We would have wonderful cures for cancer. I mean, there are so many people putting a lot of energy into... So I'm a medical researcher, so my background is in making people healthier and happier. And if we were having eureka moments all the time, for sure, we would, we would be healthier and happier and there wouldn't be such awful illnesses in the world. So actually being a medical researcher, 99% uh, of the time, the, the things that I devise, my experiments fail. And I must say that that's really tough. And in our training, we don't get any sort of help dealing mm -hmm. with that. And mm -hmm. I, I guess that um, that's actually just part of, of being a scientist and, and finding other ways of, of dealing with that failure. So mm -hmm. I recently, or two years ago, moved into a house with a gum tree. So to use that as a, another symbol, um, I sit under my gum tree when I have a, an experimental failure and I get up again and I go, well, why am I a scientist? Mm -hmm. Because around the corner, maybe, maybe around the corner is that cure um, for cancer. Or in my field, I'm, I'm looking to understand autism and understanding a little piece of the puzzle of autism actually might be able to alleviate some of the pain and suffering that people with autism experience or even their mm -hmm. families. And so I think it's that hope that, that around the corner there might be that, that discovery that gets me through those failures. I mean, that's, a, that, I mean, that's thinking about, again, talking about the, having a dream dash. That's a great yeah. way to thinking, OK, getting up off the canvas, to use the term, because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to find a cure for cancer or autism, but when I finished, I was near the, the completion of the manuscript for this new book, and um, I suddenly felt that it was not going to work. That, and I was just stage fright, I think, getting to the Confidence, end of it. Yeah. But a friend of mine who I'd spent a lot of time on the river with as a teenager, he died quite young. And one of the things I did last year when I was going through this is I went to visit his grave. And we'd been great friends. And just to sit there and think about it mm. and get up from there and thinking, this is ridiculous to be, you know, thinking about this in such negative terms. And I left there thinking, no, I'm going to finish this project. And just having that way of realigning your, yourself so that you, you, that's, you can feel down when it's not going well and mm. you have to, in fact, get up and, 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 and do something. So it's a um, of mind. The, the other thing, I, I suppose, that... that, that is maybe a little different than if I have again a dream or an idea for a story. I generally, there's, uh, yeah, I could talk to my wife or raise it with a friend, but all the work is on your own. Now, I imagine that some of your work is done with with teams, with groups of people. Yep. Now, you may have a eureka solution, but those light bulbs that go off the, of an idea. 
if you have a, a, a great sort of surge of energy around an idea, taking it to a, a team, a group of people, do you need those people to act as sounding boards for that? Do you need those people to encourage that? Or what happens when someone goes, no, nah, that's not going to work? <laughs> I think the days of Einstein are over. Mm -hmm. um, single person science doesn't exist anymore. So I've recently, just in the last two years, started working with engineers. Mm -hmm. So I'm more of a biologist. So I think um, in the visual. So I look down microscopes and I look at cells. Um, engineers think very, very differently to someone like me. I need proof, visual proof or a, a, even a verbal description. Um, of what I'm, I'm seeing or, or planning to actually make it um, something real in my head. Whereas engineers, they, they speak in, in dot points almost. So working with these people, um, ha it's completely changed the way I communicate, changed the way I think, um, and given me access to new tools. And it's not that I just use them for a sounding board, but they actually help me with my work. Mm. And as a team now, we are making some huge inroads in one of my projects. And it's just so inspirational to be able to work with such nerdy, and I use that in an affectionate um, way. I, I love the word nerd. I'm quite proud to say that I am one. But nerdy people who have just got so much energy and passion uh, for the work that they do, and for us all to put our ideas together and come up with something brand new, that is that is a privilege, and, and it's very exciting. And I think probably lastly, so you did talk about a cure for cancer, a cure mm -hmm. for autism. What's your, what's your big dream as a scientist that you would love to bring to... If, if you're in an ideal yeah. sense where your dreams come true, so to speak. So we'll get a bit... Yeah, I, I would love to say... Um, just, just Firstly, I don't know whether a cure for autism is actually the correct term. And as an autism researcher, I think that's um, a completely different uh, topic that we mm. could have a conversation for for many, many hours. Um, but my dream is actually to inspire other people and... Um, I would love to be able to find something really fantastic, but I think the whole idea of getting a Nobel Prize is, um, wouldn't that be wonderful? But I think if it does happen, it would probably be a freak accident. I think a lot of scientific discoveries are accidents. You hear of um, researchers who can only prove that their theory exists by inoculating themselves with the deadly bacteria and giving them that particular illness. And that was actually two scientists from WA. It's the way Australians do science, apparently. Um, but. I think if I was to, to make a fantastic discovery, that would just be luck. Um, and also a lot of hard work. I do work very hard. Um, but the way I live every day is actually to inspire people. And I, I really loved uh, the first conversation. Um, in human interaction is one of the, the things that really drives me. And so working with students and teaching, I, I lecture quite often. And I really enjoy that. I love the light bulb moments that other people have as a result of something that I've helped them um, understand. So I think maybe that's the teaching blood in me. I can't get it out. Emma, <laughs> is it, can, I, can I just yeah. uh, ask a question? It, I know that the, the autism spectrum is, is broad and there, are, there is a lot of variable uh, within that. Mm -hmm. Dreaming, uh, tell me when you're looking at the effects of autism, how that inhabits uh, where does dreaming come into that? Uh, does it come into it? Mm -hmm. Is there much research or well, if we talk about a scientific definition of dreaming, which is rapid eye movement sleep, yes, I can't speak so much about autism and REM sleep, but I can in other ways because yes. I'm actually very interested in what dreaming is. We all dream, and I always thought it was a very random process, random activation in the brain, but then why is it that we have reoccurring nightmares, and why is it that our ex-boyfriends or ex-partners keep coming up into our dreams? So that's I'd a, like to a, know that. Oh, I know. It's a, it's, <laughs> or why do we dream that we're about to fall and we wake up just before we actually hit the ground? So these are really interesting questions. But one of the reasons why I am an autism researcher is that as a teenager, um, my mum, because she works um, in um, uh, an area of special education, I worked with kids who had autism, and it was actually their way of seeing the world that completely inspired me into to traveling down the science um, stream and to go into neuroscience in particular. Um, one of uh, the kids I worked with, he was really, really um, excited about vacuuming and really, really excited about sweeping. And so we used to use that as a, as a reward for him. When he focused and did some work, um, he would then get to sweep and clean the whole entire classroom. So he was a really, really amazing individual. But I remember this one time that really completely shocked me. Um, someone from the, the department, a senior person who some of my, my mother's colleagues didn't like so much because he kept making decisions that disadvantaged the kids, came in 
and this this child kept pointing at him you're not dead yet you're not dead yet and everyone was really shocked because you don't just go and say you're not dead to people but this child really really truly was disturbed by this man and it took us a while a, a team of people to work out why he was so upset and it's because he was wearing one of those really cheap satin ties and he thought there was a hole through this man because his visual um, the way he actually saw the word li literally was completely different to how we saw it and I thought wow what is he going through how how is he seeing the world and that kind of inspires my work because and that's why I also said I don't believe that we, we want to cure autism but to understand how people see the world differently is one of the greatest um, challenges and if we were able to do that maybe then we can be more accepting of differences um, be it uh, someone who has a developmental disability someone who has autism someone who is just naturally different from you I think that that's key to um, to being able to live a happy and healthy life so I guess that's part of the, the motivation for why I'm in the work I'm in. I find it very, very really interesting. It's interesting, mm. it is. I think we should thank Tony now for that really broad and <laughs> engaging conversation. Thank you so much, Tony.